All right, thanks for watching. And today I want to prove the intermediate value theorem, which basically says that any continuous function must attain all of its values between its initial value and its final value. Here's what I mean by that. So suppose you have a continuous function on a comma b. So suppose f maybe looks like that. So this is f of a. And this is f of b. So f of b, not Facebook, that's something different. And if I give you any value c, between f of a and f of b, then there must be some x such that f of x equals c. In other words, any value c between f of a and f of b must be attained by f. It must be in the range of f, if you wish. And this is what the intermediate value theorem says, namely, if f from a comma b to r is continuous so continuity very important and c is any value or any number between f of a and f of b so could be equal to f of a or f of b, doesn't matter, then there is some x some x in the interval a comma b with f of x equals c. Okay. So again, given any number between f of a and f of b, that number c has to be of the form f of x. So in other words, any value between f of a and f of b has to be attained. Now, two important remarks. First of all, there's nothing special about a comma b. Any connected set would work. But more importantly, if f is continuous, this is true, but there are some non-continuous functions that satisfy this intermediate value property. So for instance, if you take what's called the topologist sine curve, so f of x to be sine of one over x, where x is not zero, and zero if x is zero, which looks as follows. So it's like sine, but it goes quicker and quicker around zero. So it's kind of crazy here, and also same thing here. It's pretty crazy. Then, this function, it's not continuous at zero, because it's just completely wild, but it does satisfy the intermediate value property. Because notice, for any c between minus 1 and 1, so between f of a and f of b, if you wish, uh, there is at least some x such that f of x equals c. So not continuous, but satisfies the intermediate value property. All right, and now let me prove the intermediate value theorem, and you'll see the proof is absolutely mwah, amazing. So step one. Well, without loss of generality, we know that c is between f of a and f of b, so assume, in fact, that c is between, strictly between f of a and f of b. Because look, first of all, if c is f of a, then we're done. We just choose x equals a. If c equals f of b, then choose x equals b. Last but not least, it might happen that uh, f of b is less than f of a, then either repeat the proof or just consider minus f, and that will also work. So it's not a big loss of generality to actually assume this order. Now, notice what do we have? We have that f 
of A is less than C. So in particular, it might be interesting to study all the values x such that f of x is less than c. And that's precisely what we want to do now. So let s be all the values x in a comma b such that f of x is less than c. And let me draw a little picture of what's going on. Here we have f of x, so this is again your function f from a to b, might look something like that, and again that's f of a, f of b, and you have a value c in between, so maybe here. This is C, and in particular, what's useful to consider is all the values of x, such that f of x is strictly below C. So in other words, S is the following set here. So this is S, and notice S is non-empty because A is in S, because f of A is in C, is less than C. So S is non-empty. Since A is in C, S, and moreover, notice S is bounded above by B because you have all the X in A comma B. So, and S is bounded above. By B. And therefore, we have again a non-empty subset of the real numbers that's bounded above. So, bang, it has the least upper bound. Let's call it x naught. x naught, which is the supremum of s. So s has a least upper bound. Bound supremum of s, which is just, we just call it x naught. All right, very good. And what do we want to show? We want to show that x naught solves our problem. So in other words, all that we need to show is that f of x naught equals to c. Again, you consider this weird set S that has a supremum, and you just want to show that f of x naught equals c. So claim. f of x naught equals c, and we'll do this by showing that on the one hand, f of x naught is less than or equal to c, and f of x naught is greater or equal to c. And you'll see, no pun intended, this is a very beautiful proof. So, I think now we're at step two. So let's show that f of x naught is less than or equal to c. But that's not a big problem because remember, x naught is a soup, and soup is not abstract anymore. More precisely, remember from the previous video on the extreme value theorem that there's a sequence Sxn in S that converges to the supremum. So by the useful lemma from last time, There is, is a sequence xn in S with xn converging to that supremum, which in this case is x0. Now, on the one hand, since xn converges to x0 and f is continuous, so since f is continuous, we know that f of xn converges to f of x0. Okay. However, on the other hand, what do we know about f of xn? Well, by definition, f 
of xn has to be less than c, because that's the definition of s. So, but, since um, xn is in s, f of xn is less than c, and therefore, if you take the limit, if you take f of x0, which is the limit of n goes to infinity of f of xn, well, it's not less than c, but less than or equal to c. Because the limit could be less than or equal to c, and therefore, we do have that f of x0 is less than or equal to c. And therefore, this step has been proven. Last but not least, let's show the other way that f of x0 is greater or equal to c. Let's do step 3. I really need this picture, that's why uh, I'm doing it on a half board. But let's show that f of x0 is greater or equal to c. And first of all, notice x0 cannot be b. So notice x0, x0 cannot be b, and for the main reason that uh, f of x0 is less than or equal to c, but by definition, f of b is greater or equal to c. Uh, Because how can the same number be less than or equal to c and greater than c at the same time? So definitely, those are two different things. And therefore, um, um, therefore for sure, uh, x0 is less than b. But then what does that mean? So if x0 is less than b, then it means for n very small, if you take x0 plus 1 over n, it's still less than b. See, so this number here is still less than b. Um, and therefore, for n small, if you take this thing, let's call it tn, which is, by definition, x0 plus 1 over n, it's still less than b. Again, for a really tiny n. Now, let's try to analyze this sequence tn a little bit. Well, notice, x0 is the supremum. So, this tn, which is bigger than x0, cannot be in your set s anymore. So on the one hand, well, notice Tn is bigger than x0, and x0 was a supremum of s. So it's bigger than the biggest value of s, so Tn is not an s. But what does it mean to be not an s? Well, it means that for sure, you're greater than or equal to c. So at least if you apply f to it. So in other words, um, if you take this tn and go up, then definitely f of tn is greater or equal to c. Hence, f of tn is greater or equal to c. Because otherwise, if it were less than c, it would be an s, which is a problem. And on the other hand, notice if as n goes to infinity, tn goes to x0. So on the other hand, and since uh, tn goes to x0 and f is continuous, we get that f of tn goes to f of x0. Goes to f of x0. 
And therefore, the point is, if you take the limit as n goes to infinity in this inequality, you get the following. Therefore, f of tn, and f of x0, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of those things that are greater or equal to c, actually becomes greater or equal to c. And that's precisely what we wanted to show. We wanted to show that f of x0 is greater or equal to c. And therefore, what do we get? Combined with the previous inequality, we do get that f of x0 equals to c, and therefore we're done, and we can stay home happy. All right, thank you very much.